are live on the Frugal Crafter YouTube channel by the skin of our teeth. <laughs> I'm Lindsay, the Frugal Crafter, here with Sarah. Hi! And we are going to paint a lovely little scene today with magnolia flowers and a goldfinch. I'm just switching my screen over here so I can see what's going on from your perspective. And, um... Yeah, yeah, I've just been running around. I haven't even had a shower this morning. I'm so glad this isn't smell-o-vision. <laughs> and Sarah's way on the other side of the room. <laughs> it's fine. It's all right. Family, family. It's all good. Um, you've pro If you've been on my blog today or if you're on my email list, you have probably heard that my new course has gone live. It is the um, Watercolor Flower Workshop. And um, there's a lot of examples on my website if you want to go check it out on my blog. And um, you can watch a promo and all that jazz. But it's 50% off for the launch month special. So if you want to grab it, it's a great time to. And all the details are in the video description. If you guys have any questions about that class, please um, let me know in the comments here during the live stream. And Sarah can uh, relay those questions to me. Because nobody's been through the course yet, so the moderators wouldn't have gone right. through and, and uh, they can't help you out on that. So those questions can go right to me. And if you have any questions about watercolor in general, any of the techniques that we're doing, you can go ahead and put those in chat too. If the moderators know the answer, they'll help you. And if not, they will send it over to me. So we are going to begin with something fun and new that I just... Dis well, I didn't discover it. Other people have done this before but it was new to me and that is wetting the back of your paper and sticking it to your to your table and i always thought that you know i'm always fine with just taping my paper down what's the big deal well the big deal is you can work with cheaper papers and maintain a uniform wetness to your paper and uh and not have the buckling as you're painting and also not have bits and pieces drying out on you so the easiest way to do this is to grab a spray bottle and just douse the back of your paper I'm going to need to get my other spray bottle. This one's getting a little... Well, we'll get the, get the industrial one here. <laughs> the old garden sprayer, the plant mister. You really just want to soak that. And then I do like to take a flat brush and spread it out. So this is sopping wet because we are going to be working wet in wet here. And I actually knew a watercolor painter who... Um, would put their they would stretch their watercolor paper on stretcher bars and they would take like a gallon of um a gallon jug and just douse the back of it with that so um so i was aware of it but i just eh, never really felt the need to try it but i decided i'd give it a go today and i'm also wetting the front of the paper really well here now i want it wet i want to make sure it's not absolutely sopping so i am going to go around the edges and just kind of blot it a little bit because i just want uniform wetness i don't want it like, I don't want it to be wet all day. You got things to paint. You don't want it wet all day. I got carried away painting this morning. That's why I have not had a shower. <laughs> all right, so we want a uniform sheen here, which we have. And the paints that I'm using are very inexpensive. They are um, a good quality student grade paint. They are the Aquafine by De La Rowney. And I'm telling you, I am just falling in love with these paints because I taught with them all weekend at the Heirloom Show in um, West Springfield, Massachusetts. And the more and more I use these, the more I saw my students use these, I just was like, you know what? These are great. They're great for the money. So if you're looking for an inexpensive set of paints, um, I recommend these. And I actually use these in my um, newest course have to go spend hundreds of dollars in order to be able to create. I'm making some puddles here on the lid of my palette. I'm using cerulean blue. Uh, I've got a little bit of um, rose matter. I've got some ultramarine blue. And we're going to put some sap green. Did you slide your palette down just a little bit? Oh, yes. The top where your paint is is cut off. Sure, there we go. People love to see you mix your colors. <laughs> So what I'm going to do now is I am going to start off by putting some of the cerulean blue up here in the sky area. Now, um, I am not going to paint over everything. I'm going to go around the, um, the flower and look how interesting this is. So typically when I just wet, I taped down my paper and I just wet one side, if I did this, the color would go everywhere, everywhere the paper was wet. But for some reason, having the back of the paper wet too, I can go right up to my flower and not really have too much of it going where I don't want. Um, I think it just makes the paper a lot easier and the paint a lot easier to control. So that's why I was kind of excited to try this because we're going to be putting a wash 
on everything here. So I'm going to add some, and you notice how the colors aren't blending into each other either so much. They're kind of staying where I put them. And that's kind of neat. Usually you don't have that. Usually everything just wants to bleed together. And look at how close I got. I went right up to the line. I've got a little feathering there, which you can expect with wet paper, but it's not like moving um, moving into that flower shape like it would if we had just wet one side of the paper. So for me, that was super exciting. And don't you just love a medium that will continue to surprise you even after you've been painting with it for, let's just say over 30 years. I'm just gonna work our way around, go in between. I just can't get over how my paint is not going where I don't want where I don't want it to go. I think that's so exciting. I grab some sap green and get some of that down in here so that I get the. No, I did accidentally go right on top of the bird. That wasn't the paper's fault. I did that and get some of this green. Mix a little bit lower. Do you have uh, a question? Yes, Terry. What is your what brand is your go-to sap green in professional grade paint? I like the M. Graham Sap Green, and I also like the Sennelier Olive Green. They're very similar in color. But there's a lot of good ones out there. Those are just, you know, those are my favorites. Probably my favorites because I found them, I liked them, and just kept buying them instead of, exper kept, instead of, you know, continuing to look after I found what I like. I don't care for the Windsor & Newton Sap Green so much. It's not as, um, it's not as robust as the M. Graham or the Sennelier. Now, if you do get your brush where you don't want it and you put some color where you don't want it, you want to press straight up and down with your paper towel and lift that away so you don't end up having to fight that when you go to do a delicate color, such as the yellow on the bird or the very pale pinks and purples that we're going to do on the flowers. I also want to do a little bit of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to make kind of a muted gray, and we'll put that down here towards the bottom as well. And feel free to interrupt me if anyone has questions, because I'm just kind of... Hot up for the moment. Oh, good. I totally lost track of time this morning, and I was just kind of <clears throat> wondering if I was going to get everything uh, going on time today. Now I want to get some texture in my background. Oh, I've got to put a little color onto our focal points, too. We don't want to forget them. Grab a little bit of the pink. I'm using the purple and the um, rose matter. I'm just going to get a little bit of color in there. I'm not going to worry about getting that color in the background so much. And remember, this is really wet, so you are going to have a shift as it dries. I feel like you just have days to work with this um, this paper because nothing is drying out on you and you don't have to fight like how fast it's drying. If you want to highlight on anything right now, you can go ahead and blot it. If you notice, like I kept the tips of the flowers pretty light here. I'm just going to gently just kind of tap my paper towel in there to lift out a little bit of light. And I like this rather than just painting um, a background around everything because you don't end up with that with like a, a hard edge that doesn't look very natural. All right, I'm going to paint some yellow on the bird. By the way, the brush I'm using is a number 14 round Menta brush. I'm using, uh, it's about a medium yellow. I'd say it's probably... Um, like a Hansa yellow. I'm just going to go ahead and add that to the bird. Uh, Baru Siva, why are there a few pencils called, whoops, yep, bumped up, bumped up, hang on, let me start over. Uh, why are there a few pencils called Verithian and Prismacolor Manga Set? Those are um, meant for like doing um, really crisp 
details so they're a harder thinner lead so like um if you want to re like prismacolors are so soft that when you go to color with them they wear down really quickly and if you're trying to do something like eyelashes or outlining where you just want a really crisp line it's really difficult to get that with the prismacolors you have to keep sharpening and then you're wasting your material so um the very thin pencils kind of solve that i have a hard time with those i the only ones i have are from that kit, same kit you're talking about and um they just they like one i just sharpened down to a nub because it, the thing kept breaking um because the lead is so fine and brittle uh, i just had a real time with them and then the ones that, that were working fine i just didn't like now i'm adding some cad yellow deep and a little bit of burnt sienna to make kind of like a warmer reddish yellow and I'm going to add some of that into the, the uh, darker areas of my bird. And it's just for detail stuff. Some people like to compose completely in it, but like you could do your drawing, your underdrawing with the very thin pencils. They're less waxy, so you could uh, keep layering on more waxy pencil on top. So some artists will use that for that uh, quality, but uh, I, don't, I, I don't personally care for them, but you know, I'm, I'm not like a very serious color pencil artist. I work kind of fast and loose on toned paper, so... I'm not the you know, target market for those either. Uh, Starshine Soldier, where can I find the Menta brushes? I don't have an AC Moore in California. I think you might just have to be patient until some online stockists start carrying them. I don't know of any that are yet. Um, I don't think Jerry's Artorama carries any Royal Nine Nickel products. Um, I don't know why, but usually um, Michaels will carry the Royal Nine Nickel so, um, brushes so maybe they're gonna have them too I don't think they're exclusive when I asked the rep she said that they're just so new that not many stores have picked them up yet um, so that would probably be what I'd suggest is ask your local uh, your local store if they would stock them but I would reckon that probably Michaels would have them eventually the um, the Zen brushes are very similar to the, the Mentas and Michaels does carry them at least they they used to I don't we don't have a Michaels up here so I don't know, and even when I was in West Springfield, we only ran in there for a second because one of my friends that travel that we traveled with forgot a tote bag for shopping, so we just ran in there to uh, to grab that. And I didn't buy a single thing, even with a pass through. Really? Twenty minutes, I didn't buy a single thing. I was so good till I got to the stamp show. <laughs> well, you were saving it for, for the That's good true. stuff because I mean we do have a Michaels, you know, less than two hours away. That's so. true. We have one in Augusta. Probably get to Massachusetts as frequently as I get to Augusta, unfortunately. Right. Or fortunately, however you want to look at it. It's funny because if I'm ever, ever down there, I'm usually not going to Augusta because my folks live fairly close to there, so I'm visiting them, I'm not down there shopping. Okay, so if you want to paint your branches, you can. Just keep in mind your edges are going to be a little softer. I think that's kind of pretty for the branches towards the back. And I totally forgot to transfer on the rest of my branch, so I'm just going to leave it out. I'll just grab some burnt sienna. And since the burnt sienna is very um, red in this set, I'm going to grab a little bit of ultramarine blue just to tone it down a bit. And I'm just going to go in and throw in a little bit of that branch and make sure I anchor the branch to the edge of the paper, so I'm pulling it right off the edge and it will just give the impression of it being more substantial and longer. And you don't have to fill in everything because we are gonna work on this as it gets dry too. And I'm just gonna put a little bit in here, but I can leave some of the white sparkle. This is a nice way to go in under the bird so you can have a nice shadow there and you can also paint right over the feet because this is a, gonna be fairly light in tone so I don't have to worry about losing the, uh, you know, painting around the feet later or losing any detail. Now something else that's really fun to do on this stage because remember, we haven't done a lot yet, we don't have a lot to lose if something doesn't go right, is flicking some of the colors in the background to get a really nice soft effect. So this is also a great way to integrate Oh my gosh, I'm having a hard time talking today. To You're integrate... talking very fast, too. Okay, Take i got to calm down. I've I had... have a question for you. Okay. Janine Chrysler, are there mediums for watercolor like there are for other kinds of paint? Yes, there are. Um, I have used the, well, like, masking fluid as a medium, or they, it's, it's in the medium section anyway. 
Um, there's iridescent medium to make your paint sparkly. If you want sparkly watercolors, you don't need to go buy sparkly watercolors. You can just use that medium. There is granulation medium, which makes your paint, if you can kind of see, I don't know if you can make that out where it's uh, still wet, but certain colors granulate means they, the pigments kind of settle in the um, pores of the, in the surface of the paper and they give you this interesting texture and pattern. And they have a medium that will make any color do that. There's also a texture medium that we used on a uh, tutorial of the seals a while back. Seals or sea lions, I guess, they're bigger than, than seals. Um, and it just gives your, gives your paper like kind of like a, a grit. Um, there's all kinds of different mediums. So yeah, I mean, I typically am more of a purist with my watercolor, but there's no, need, no reason why you shouldn't experiment with them. There's also ox gall, which is an additive to paint anyway, but you can add more if you want your paint to flow more. Like if you like that kind of whoosh of your paint across the, the uh, surface of your paper, um, there's all kinds of mediums. Generally with art, if people will buy it, they will make it. Sometimes you can get little sampler packs too. I know Windsor Newton makes a little medium sampler, which um, has smaller bottles, which is really a great idea because I don't know, the way I use mediums, I'll probably I, you know, get a bottle and it's a lifetime supply <laughs> for me because I hardly ever use it. But then you could try before you invest in a larger bottle of, of anything. I'm just tapping on this paint to give a little texture in the background. I'm just getting this first layer um, pretty much covered. I want to cover the paper um, fairly thoroughly. We're going to be building up on this paper as it's drying. So as time goes on, we're going to be able to put more detail into things. So it's kind of a fun technique. The only thing is you want a little bit of a plan. So even if it's just a simple line sketch, or I, I think I would want a few pencil lines just so I know where I'm going with colors and stuff. Um, so it does require a little bit of planning, but not much. I mean, you could trace a pattern like I provided today, or you could just freehand. What I did was I freehanded my sketch for my first painting, and then I put my painting on the light box after it was dry and just traced it because I like the way that it turned out. But I like that you can keep working in and blending if you're not happy with something, like if this is too much of the same color, you could still blot it and remove it. This is the Aqua Bee paper that you can get on Amazon for, um, you can get like 50 sheets for $15, between 15 and 20, depending on how popular it is. The prices tend to move around a little <laughs> bit over there. A, bit. a little bit, yeah. Um, I was excited to see it was $15 today though. I just want to look for any puddles. There shouldn't be any puddles, but sometimes when you splash, you'll get an uneven bit of um, uh, surface on the paper. So I would blot that a little bit so I don't end up with a big uh, blossom anywhere. I don't want one. And now I'm going to start moving to a smaller brush and building up some colors here and there. So I'm going to go with my number eight round. This is a mimic. You could use your mimic brushes for this whole thing pretty much. Um, I did bring in a rake because it's kind of fun to do the texture on our bird when it's dry with the rake. Oh, look at this. My paper is pretty flat. That's with like having both so sides soaking wet so, and not taped down. So that's another um, nice thing about wetting the backs. It does, it does uh, even out the surface tension a little bit of your paper. So I want violet. I'm trying to slow down, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Too much coffee. And a little bit of rose matter. And I'm going to start adding in some darker areas. I'll blot that off. I have a little bit too much paint, but instead of like blotting it off there, I'm going to wipe my brush off. And then I am just going to spread it out a little bit. This is such a neat trick. Somebody had recently mentioned it to me. Um, might have been off K. I'm not sure. It was one of my viewers. And I was kind of thinking, oh yeah, I've heard of that, you know, but I, I hadn't intended on trying it, but for whatever reason this morning, I thought, I'm going to give that a go. Uh, Amelia Grin, how wet is the paper when you do this technique? This paper is, um, it's uniformly wet. Um, I wet it from the back side and then from the front, I did blot off excess water. So um, there's no puddles, but it is, it's fairly, it is saturated. But as we're going along, it is drying a little bit, so. 
I'm able, I'm going to be getting more detail and my colors will be darker as I move along. You probably can't notice it because you've been watching the whole time, but the colors are going to lighten up as we go, because the background colors, because as they dry, the more water you start off with, your colors are going to look a lot darker than they are because the water magnifies it. Um, so that, that first layer is going to get, it's going to go lighter and lighter as it starts to dry. I hope that makes sense. Uh, Jesse James, do you prefer acrylic gouache or regular gouache? I prefer regular gouache, but I prefer acrylic gouache to regular acrylic paint. I like this, the sheen of it. You want to make sure you do keep the lights towards the top of those flowers so that um, you don't have to scrub back. It is going to be more difficult to scrub off colors when you've worked with the front and the back um, saturated like that. At least I found in my one experience in doing this technique, <laughs> I'm all of a sudden an expert. So that's just my findings. I am finding I'm, I keep laying my hand in my wet. That's the only the bad thing is like, if you're somebody who tends to rest your hand or your arm on your painting, it uh, it's gonna get a little soggy. You also have to um, keep your brush at a fairly uniform. Uh, wetness. So if I need to lighten a color, I need to mix up the color lightly and then I need to blot my brush off. I need to load up my brush and blot it off so I don't get too much. So that will just be a little bit of a learning curve as you're going, but um, that's not bad. That's supposed to be a leaf according to my painting, so I will be painting that green eventually. And I'm just kind of playing with a combination of the purple and the pink just to get a nice variety of little colors here. Uh, Omnion, do your colors bleed out of the lines if it's all wet? It, because I wet the back, it's not really bleeding. I'm very surprised. Um, this is still soaking wet, and, and my colors are staying pretty much where I put them. Uh, Terry, what is your favorite source for free reference photos to paint from? I find myself using Unsplash a lot. Um, U-N-S-P-L-A-S-H. Uh, they have some beautiful photos there. Um, that's, that's where I go most of the time, but I also use Pexels and a Pixabay, and I have uh, gone to Morgue File before. I don't have as much luck there, but, um, but yeah, I have more luck in, um, in Unsplash, and I do some paid, a paid site that I've belonged to before, so. Uh, Mary Shows, I'm excited about the new class. Does it have any lessons on loose flower painting with no drawing first? Yes, uh, the, only, the only lesson that requires drawing is um, the lilacs and we're just doing a rounded rectangle and the um, daffodil painting which does have it I do a drawing demo which you can follow along with me but I also have the pattern available if you don't want to draw all the flower all the flowers other than that are done freehand and um, you're taught stroke work first so that you can you can kind of break apart flowers afterwards and kind of figure out how to paint them just using your basic strokes and create um, kind of filler flowers to accent them uh, very easily from your imagination. Ashton Mack, why, why is hot press paper recommended for botanical paintings? Because it's so smooth that it's easy to capture a crisper detail and with bot botanicals you are going for that absolute beautiful um, fine detail. It's kind of like if you were um, going to draw on paper, if you had a really rough paper it'd be hard to draw and blend really smoothly. It's the same idea with watercolor painting. And some botanical artists actually use real vellum, which is like um, lambskin, I believe, uh, because it's so smooth. Which kind of creeps me out. That just seems kind of weird. The only thing 
I don't like about this, and I think if I was going to do this a lot, I would um, take a, a piece of cardboard and co and put like contact paper on it so I could move it around because I find myself wanting to like get on the other side of my table and and pull a um, and pull a brush stroke from there. So that would be my recommendation. Would be to uh, or get a little piece of Teflon mat, like cut it down small so you can twirl it around if you need to. And we haven't dried anything. We're still working as the paint, is, the paper is kind of drying on its own, but it's it's staying fairly wet. I can start to see areas where it's starting to dry around. Like I can see where I splash some paint there. I am getting a little bit of a hard edge, but for the most part, everything's staying very uniformly wet. The year. there's a pattern for this um, I got my blog post up a little late today but the um, the pattern is on my blog and you can download that print it out or I guess if you have a bright um, new screen monitor you could just pull it up and you could put your paper to it it feels like a glass one I guess somebody said they do that I thought that was a really handy tip And we're not going for our darkest values here. We're just going for kind of some like light to mid tones. I wouldn't want to do any details at this point because it could feather. Like I wouldn't want to do the beak, eyes, or darker feathers or feet until I have dried the paper. So we're just going to go up to everything except for the final details and um, kind of build it that way. I'm going to wipe off my palette a little bit because I am losing mixing area. And I think I'm pretty much done with those background colors. And I'm going to go in with Cad Yellow. And these would all be hues in this palette because it is a student grade palette. So, um, you But you can use regular Cad Yellow if, if you have it, if you want to. Hopefully that's not glaring too much for you. Any place I want that nice bright yellow, I'm going in with this. And you can see that it doesn't seem to be like mixing in with my color underneath. I can just kind of glaze over what I already have and get that really nice um, griselle type of shading going on. I don't want to go over this wing part because there's a little kind of like cap over the wing that's nice and bright and fluffy. You can tell the feathers are yellow and black, but then these have like more strict um, black and white leaves, so I'm just kind of skipping over that area. But look, it's, I mean, it's not going into the background. That just like blows my mind. Watercolor is one of those mediums you can paint every day of your life with it, and you will still be surprised by something new it does or doesn't do. I'm going to take my burnt sienna. Notice the, the difference in the consistency of how I'm working now. I do not want to go in there with super wet paint because if I do, I could get the hard edges. So I am making sure that when I mix out, I am keeping it a little bit on the on the drier side. So I've got this kind of um, uh, cool brown here. I'm going towards gray. So that's why I'm taking the burnt sienna and adding the ultramarine blue. And I'm going to add some of this to the bottom of the tail, the underside of the tail. And I'm going to start working on the tip of my brush so that I don't end up with, um, so I can get some, uh, the feeling of some little individual feathers. I can also add this up here on this area where it's a little bit darker on the yellow feathers. Uh, I can also go next to the head here so we get a little definition on the head. Jesse Venton, I tend to have problems with everything drying too fast. Any suggestions? I would try this technique, Jesse. I think that it would be uh, perfect if you're having an issue. I know sometimes when I'm working with a cellulose paper, it will want to dry out, either dry out too fast, or one area of the paper will dry quickly, and then the rest of it is still like puddly. So yeah, I would try this, or at least you're starting off with a nice... Um, um, a nice uniform wetness on the paper to begin with. As you're applying these darker colors, 
rock your brush with the contour of the body. So pretend if you're petting that bird, how your, your hands would go over um, the muscles and follow the shape of the body. Your brush should do that as well. Uh, I apologize for the pronunciation of the name. Majile Naidu, what is the most valuable lesson you've learned about painting in watercolor? To let the water do the work. Don't fight it. Let the water do what it wants to do. Go with the flow. And in fact, that's a good method. That's a good uh, lesson for life, too. Go <laughs> with the flow. So my yeah. dad used to say, Lindsay, you always want to buck the system. You always <laughs> want to fight. Just go with the flow. Can't always go with the flow. Sometimes the flow is wrong. Sometimes but... the flow is wrong. Uh, Yosifa Saladanya, is her is your watercolor flower class beginner type or better to do the essentials class instead if we're starting out? Well, I always recommend the essentials class just because I feel it's a little bit more traditional. Um, but I did design the watercolor floral class to be able to be done by beginners. And that's why I went with a um, less expensive supply list. Um, so it's up to you. I mean, if, if all you want to do is paint flowers, you know, you're, it's not going to hurt to do it. Um, if you're trying to pick between the two, the essentials class is definitely more geared to teach you the basics for anything you want to paint, where this is focusing on florals. So um, it is beginner friendly. There is a class at the end of the watercolor floral class that does negative painting. And actually there is in the, in the essentials class too. I recently added it. Um, that you would want a little practice before you attempted that because it is more advanced but um i i guess short answer i'd say go for the essentials but you if you're a beginner you will be able to do the watercolor florals class without any issue it's just if you're if you're really just wanting to learn how to watercolor paint starting from uh ground zero i still rec recommend the essentials class because you'll have a little bit of everything whether you want to paint you know, flowers or still life or landscapes or, you know, you have a little bit more, a little bit more variety in subjects. So just depends on what you want to paint. Okay. Did you have another question? Yes. Okay. Uh, just let me get bumped up. Uh, Wendy Slowski, what is your favorite go-to water brush? Um, I honestly don't love water brushes, but you know, they're, they're handy sometimes. Uh, I would say my favorite is the um, the Koi, the Sakura Koi. The Arteza ones are pretty good too. I haven't had used them as long as the Koi's, but I, I, I the Koi's don't disappoint. Is you know any more than any other water brush? <laughs> they're better. I think they're a little bit better. Okay, so I did do a little bit of the darker detail on the wing. It's not going to be as dark as the eye of the beak, and I'm not going to go to the eye and the beak yet. I'm going to take some of this dark color. Again, it's the ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. A little more burnt sienna to it. And I'm just going to go in and add some little details onto the branches. And a little bit of just enough water so it will flow. Especially on the bottom side of your branches. This will be a slightly more crisp line than what you had before. And we are just about ready to dry our paper. So at this point, you want to look at your design and see if there's anything you missed. If you missed painting in the um, foundation area on the bird or any of the flowers or leaves, you want to go ahead and do that. I can see I missed a leaf right there and that's a leaf. So I'm going to go ahead and make that green before I get to, before I dry it. The other neat thing about this is that you get to um, you get to get so much done right off the bat. And if you're working on a larger painting, you have a little more time. You can also go in if you have some leaves and you can put a little bit of a, a little bit of a darker shading on the bottoms of them.
Now we're going to dry, so if anybody has any questions while I'm running the heat tool, that's a great time to ask them. This will take a little longer to dry because <laughs> I'm going to have to dry one side, flip it over, dry the back I was just side. Ask you, do you have to dry both yes, sides? Yes, I do, yeah. And you better tell everyone what you're using because we'll get a few questions about the tool that you're using. Oh, yes. This we is, always do. This is an embossing heat tool by Marvie. I've had this for probably about five years. Previous to this one, I had another embossing tool by Marvie, and I had that for about 10 years. So rather than blowing a bunch of air, it just blows heat. So it, uh, you're not going to push your paint around as you're drying. I'm going to blot these uh, puddles so I can flip it and work on the other side. I like to flip it before it's completely dry so I can even out the tension on the paper. Just be careful not to set your painting in a puddle on your table. In fact, I'm gonna wipe that up before I uh, <clears throat> before I forget and set my painting in it. <laughs> and I set my wet painting on top of my dry painting that's sitting on the table. <laughs> so I like to alternate it, flip it both ways, so that it helps it from uh, from buckling too much. The reason why the paper buckles is because you have a bunch of water in one area and then it's, you have the fibers of the paper, paper fighting each other. It's flattening out quite nice. Even on edges where we did have puddles, it's not a really strong hard edge. Um, not like you would have gotten if you had had your wet wash and started to dry and you flicked paint on it. That water underneath helped keep it a little bit more even. people do we have hanging out with us? We have 261. Wow, 261 people watching paper dry. <laughs> the replay people can just pop right past this. Well, that's the nice thing. Yeah. But people are chatting too. So. That's good. Yeah, I got a lot of people using the gear button to either slow me down or speed me up when they're, when they're watching. <laughs> they say, I watch it at, at drunk Lindsay speed, which is half time, or chipmunk <laughs> Lindsay speed, which is double time. So it's a little cockled, but it'll, it'll flatten out as it cools down. Um, it's definitely dry enough for us to continue on. And I am going to stay with the number eight brush because I'm not getting into super detail at this point. I do want to make sure I have a fresh paper towel for blotting my brush so I don't end up with any um, beads of paint or water that I don't want. And I'm gonna start with my violet or purple, I guess they call it purple in this palette, and some rose matter. We're getting kind of mixing it for kind of like a mauve color. And again, now that I can move this around, I'm gonna take advantage of that and I'm going to get it so I'm pulling the stroke towards my hand. And I'm going to go in with another glaze on these flowers. Now I've got too much paint on my brush, so I'm just going to go ahead and plop it down on each flower, and then I'll come by and I'll spread it. So if you're going to do that, you do have to work a little quickly. And you can pull up some individual veining if you're good with your uh, round brush. If not, you can always go in with, your, um, with a smaller brush later. So if you're not comfortable kind of flicking with the tip of your brush like that, you don't have to. Go in with a smaller one after. There's nothing wrong with that. 
sometimes brushes aren't pointy enough to do that so so don't worry about it if if you're not getting that technique remember just like with the bird your brush strokes should go with the contour of the thing you're painting here in this case it would be the magnolia there are little wrinkles and veins and stuff so you want to make your brush stroke go with that so you can kind of get that feeling uh, Nasa Oberlin will you be offering a discount on your other teachables um, on my patterns whenever you download one, one of my patterns uh, I usually put a coupon code on it, and uh, but I'll tell you what it is. It's teach me for twenty percent off any of the other courses. But if you're going to get the new one, use the use the Flower Power discount code because that's only good for this month. But it will give you fifty percent off, and fifty percent is way better than twenty percent. Don't be afraid to move that paper around. Because your brush strokes will uh, will stay nice and crisp now that the paper's dry. <clears throat> I do like this number eight round an awful lot by uh, Creative Mark. It's from the value set of Mimic Brushes. Um, I know a lot of you guys have that set, and I've been using it almost in every painting since I got it a couple of years ago, and it has not dulled at all. They are more expensive than the Menta brushes, and you have to order them online, either from Jerry's or Amazon. So I think they're only available in the United States. I don't think you can get them overseas. Unless somebody has a has a supplier and they want to share that in the comments, that would be wonderful. But as far as I know, um, it's an American only product. But I think Royal Nickel does sell overseas, so hopefully the Menta brushes will be available. And there's also Princeton Neptune, which is um which is a really nice faux fur watercolor brush, and that's available worldwide, I believe. Okay, and now I am going to start building up some texture on the bird. Now this is a really fun brush. This is called a rake, and I used it in my stamping video yesterday, actually. And I don't, you probably won't be able to tell until I wet this brush uh, what's really cool about it. But if you look now, I'm going to bring this up closer to the camera. I'll bring on the paper towel here. You can see that the hairs on the end are um, they're like like kind of like they've snipped in. So there are more hairs from two-thirds of the way down to the ferrule than there are at the, the top third of the brush. So it gives you little wisps. And um, these are available in flats or filberts. And the filberts actually are a little bit, I think, a little easier to work with. But the flats are a little easier to find. So I'm just going to use this flat here. This one's by Royal Nine Nickel. I think it was three bucks at the craft store. It's one of the soft grip ones. And I'm just going to go in. And I've got that brown-blue mix. So it's kind of like a dark brown. I added some yellow to it. So it's kind of like a, a yellowy, yellowy brown. And I'm just going to flick in some texture. Now I need that a little wetter so that the paint can come off the little hairs. So I'm going to mix it up a little bit darker because I need it to go a little bit wetter. I need to have more water in there. I always test it somewhere where I've already got like a lot of, um, a lot of paint so that I know that it's it's going to work, but it, if it doesn't, or if it drags, or if I get a big blob, it's not going to be that noticeable. And you just want to do little, little drags with it and go with the, the direction of the feathers. Uh, Kendall McCauley, which oranges are your favorite? I actually mix my own, but I do like, um, I do like cadmium orange. That's a really robust color. Um, Pyrrole orange is really a, a really cheerful one. I like navel oranges. Navel oranges. <laughs> oh, did you that? Was, no, she didn't color, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I meant I was making a joke. It just didn't. Oh. It didn't go like I thought it would. Oh, I like the Cara Cara oranges. Those are good too. 
If you get too much, just blot it before it starts to set. Now I'm going to go in with some yellow, and this time I think I'll grab the, um, I think I'll grab some lemon yellow actually. And put in some of the brighter colors, like that you should get a little highlight on her underbelly, like the roundest part of her belly. And I think actually the bird in the reference photo was even more plump than this one. It's been a good year for this goldfinch. And some over here up on the rounder part of her chest. And on the head. And by patting it in with this brush, we're getting we're also kind of adding to the texture and the fluff. You can drag a little bit off the edge. Um, you'll need to go back to the darker color to do that. And I'm just going to start at the side of the body and just kind of flick it out. This just pretty much shows up as fluff. It doesn't really look like much of anything. So I'm going to go a little darker so I can actually see a few feathers. So burnt sienna, ultramarine blue, pretty watery. It's only watery because those little hairs, they need the water for the paint to move. Uh, Axe, how can we protect our finished paintings if we want to frame it without the glass, or is it just better to put the glass in? I would say it's better to put the glass in, but my friend Angela Fair has a wonderful tutorial on her website, uh, on her YouTube channel, where she uses Dorland's wax to, um, and she'll mount her paintings to a like a birch panel. Um, you can buy them at our supply stores or probably make your own, but they're like a um, they're like a canvas, but instead of canvas, they've got birch on them and they've got wood on the sides, and uh, she just glues them to that, and then she covers them with Dorland's wax, and you know she sells them like that. So I would check out her tutorial because it's really in depth and I haven't tried it yet. I did buy a little Dor Dorland's wax to try it, but I just haven't uh, gotten that far. But I'm a big believer on paper art being behind glass just because it's so delicate. Using some of this dark kind of in a V shape around the eye, so, still with that rake brush. Do you like to do birds and animals? Um, you really ought to look into getting a rake brush. They're not very expensive and they can really save you a lot of time and energy. The only thing to, to just be concerned with when you're using the rake brush is to vary your strokes um, because it's kind of like a fan brush in the, in the sense where sometimes you can like look at somebody's painting and say, oh, they used a fan brush for that because you have that very uniform um, like batch of strokes that comes out from it. But the filberts are a little bit easier to control from that. that uh, from that perspective. All right, now I'm gonna take a small brush and paint the legs, and this is um, a Fusion, which I actually bought these for gouache because they're a little bit stiffer, but today when I was um, working on this painting, I grabbed it because I, I needed a small round, and the, uh, the small round brush I had for watercolor was kind of blunt, and I wasn't getting a smaller line than I did on with this brush, so I grabbed this one and it worked really good. It doesn't hold too much water, so it's really good when you want a dark line. And these are available at craft stores. Um, that's the Royal and my Nickel Fusion line. I'm sure you can order them online too. Um, but sometimes it's hard. I like to buy my brushes in person unless I'm absolutely sure. I've talked to somebody that's used them because being able to, you know, pick it up and look at it, you can really tell whether you've got a decent brush, I think anyway. Uh, Satomi Emoki, are you adding any water to the brush as you do the feathers? Um, I'm mixing water and pigment on my palette because the brush does need, the rake brush does need to be wetter than your other brushes because the, the little hairs are so sparse that are actually carrying the paint. Now when I do legs, I actually like to tap them in so I get a little bit of that texture. And that way when I tap them, I get kind of like like little knuckles and, and stuff in there a little bit easier. It just looks a little more natural to me. And I can always tap it wider. So I try to go skinny so that I can always go wider if I need to. Uh, Jupiter, thoughts on Prismacolor watercolor pencils? I don't like them. I love the regular color pencils, but the watercolor ones just kind of disappoint me. 
if you have them, use them. I'm not. I don't want to disparage anybody that has them. But if you're buying new, um, it would not be your first no, they recommendation. Wouldn't. They wouldn't. And if you're trying to find a new set, what I what I did before I invested was I bought a few open stock pencils from a few companies, and I tried them out, and then then I bought a full set from the one I liked because I know it's cheaper in the long run to buy a full set because like if you buy a set of 12 then you love them then you end up having to buy you go and you buy a set of 72 but then you have those 12 repeated so and inevitably you always have a couple of colors that you don't use very often right uh nasa oberlin is there a difference between a rack and comb brush no say so rake and chrome are the same thing rake and chrome So when I painted the beak, I did leave a little sparkle, like a little um, sliver, unpainted, just so it showed kind of like um, the division between the bottom and top beak. I'm gonna add a little bit more water to my brush. My paint is fairly thick. Um, I'm gonna mix up a little bit more too. I want the paint about the consistency of half and half, or um, like a like whole milk. It's you know kind of thick. I guess pretty much everyone would know what half and half is, right? Kind of like a thicker milk consistency. Yeah, it's it's like cream, but not, not heavy cream. Yeah, like light cream. it's like in between regular milk and heavy cream. I I've watched John pour it into his coffee. I don't use it myself, so. So all I did was a bunch of parallel curved lines. I know it can be hard to see because we're going over a darker area, and if you want, you can make them a little bit wider at the top. And I'm just doing that by wiggling my brush up and down just so I have a little bit of a shadow under that little cut cap area. And I'm going to do the same thing under here. We get so many goldfinches on our feeders. They're so cute. Right, we have quite a few too. We actually, I was telling one of the people, we have uh, the purple finches. Yes, we do too. You have a couple of those? Yes. Maybe they're the same ones. We look fairly close. It could be. Uh, Jesse Venton, what do you think of Elzerian, El El Elizarin, Crimson? Someday I'll get it right the first time. Elizarin Crimson's light fastness, and do you have any recommendations for substitutes? Yeah, just get a permanent Elizarin Crimson. It's made with a, they now make it with a quinacridone pigment, so um, I would get that. I mean, in most most paints, I think most paint sets now are going to go with a permanent. I think it's just as cheap to make as the original Alizarin Crimson. Usually when you get a hue, it's uh, like seen as a bad thing, but with Alizarin Crimson, the hue is going to be more permanent than the than the traditional. Now I need to have a little shadow in here because uh, I need to divide that tail from the body. So I just went in, made a curvy line, and feathered it out with my little brush. And at this point in the pa painting, everything I'm going to do is going to be a small brush, unless I'm spattering. because. Um, that will keep me from adding adding too much paint and and I'm messing anything up. I feel like the eye needs to, needs to be a little rounder. I'm going to go a little bit lighter with my color here. I'm going to take a little water and add it. And now I'm going to be putting in just a few more um, kind of structural details on the bird. I'm going to actually I'm just gonna check it check the ferrule this metal part look for any beads of water because you don't want one of those surprising you when you're doing little details um, and I'm gonna put in some little flicks in here so when you go into kind of the detail flicks I don't like to do that I like to do my rake work before I go in with a little brush because um, by going over with a little brush and you putting all these hairs in individually these little feathers individually, you're gonna kind of disturb any odd pattern that your rake brush made. Just go with the contour of the body at all times or with the leaf, the flower petal, either way. And you won't be wrong, everything will look nice and, uh, nice and balanced and natural. Uh, Joan Halverson, what are your thoughts on ink tent pencil, ink tents pencils? I love them. I'm sorry, was it more to the question? I was so excited. Nope, that, <laughs> nope it was just me having, uh, apparently this week I'm having trouble talking. 
That's okay. I really like them. They are... Have you ever used them, Sarah? I have not. I, I You should borrow mine. They are so fun. I've only really been doing the uh, watercolor pencils because with my wrists and my hands, regular water, like regular yeah. pencils are too hard, like too hard for me to grip. Well, these are, they're, they're a water-soluble pencil, but they're like ink. They're like super mm, bright. I might have to try a couple. Oh my gosh, they are nice. And the, the nice thing about them is that once they dry, once you've like, you've colored with them and you've wet them completely yep. and you've let them dry, then you could go over there with a wet brush and scrub them and they're not going to come up. There are some colors, and I, and I don't know if it's because they're not permanent, um, but I've like colored with red before and, and then let it dry and gone over it, but I think it's because I colored so thickly mm -hmm. that I didn't actually get every bit of pigment wet. Right. Um, but they are, they are fan, they're fantastic. They're my favorite. I, I hate to recommend them as watercolor pencils, though, because they are more of an ink, and if you're hoping to be able to lift up something that you've done with them, it's not going to happen like it would with a regular watercolor pencil. Um, but as far as water soluble pencils go, they're 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 probably my favorite. I also like the Albright drawer ones. They're very similar and they're semi permanent too. So you know they have kind of the same quality qualities. Uh, but yeah, they're fantastic. And sometimes you can get a steal on them, like on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I'll, well, maybe I'll I'll uh, try a couple here sometime. Oh, absolutely. I have them in a little travel set so I can sit on the porch and use them. Very nice. Now, if you want any um, more extreme details, uh, I actually think I want my flowers a little bit redder, so I'm going to grab my um, my rose matter here. Maybe just a little bit of purple so I don't have it completely different. And I can go in and throw in any other little bits of detail I want. A little more control with this small brush than I would have with the bigger one. But the downside is you have to reload it. In fact, I'm going to go to a liner because I don't want to be reloading every two seconds. So that's the difference between a round brush and a liner. So if you've ever, if you're trying to decide, do I want that liner with that really long bristle? What's up with that? Or do I want this tiny short one? Um, the longer the bristle, the more paint it will hold. But the longer the bristle, the less control you have. So that's when, that's how you can kind of determine what you need. Do you need a lot of control? Or do you need to be able to carry a lot of paint and not have to reload? These are these are pretty long fluid lines, so I don't need a lot of control, so a liner is gonna be better for me. If I was painting eyelashes on a giraffe, I'd probably want this. <laughs> you mean like the two fabulous giraffe paintings I got for my birthday? Oh, yes, did you like those? I love them, I was very excited. Oh good, Jason said you liked them. Yes. Uh, but I was away on your birthday. Well, you were busy being your fabulous self in Massachusetts. It was fun too. I had a ball. I didn't know if I'd have a voice by the time I came back. <laughs> well, you probably talked nonstop. Talked nonstop, and then I had a big class, so it was. I it was. I felt like I had to really yell kind of for people to hear me because the the show is so big, and then your the classrooms right out in the middle, right? Well, not in the middle of the show, but in the in the convention hall. So it was. It was a. Uh, I had to project. I'm sure you did. Well, and you looked like you had good sized classes too. Yeah, yeah. So they were pretty spread out, but it was, um, but it was great because they had plenty of room for everybody. Nobody had to be cramped. The students were really awesome. There wasn't any. Um, I can't do this. Everyone's like, bring it on. That's 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 refreshing because a lot of people are like, I can't do this. I oh my god, this is I'm no artist. <laughs> I do the same thing sometimes. It can be intimidating, especially, you know, you're with, you might be with people you've never met before and you might be kind of afraid to make a mistake, but no, everybody was really awesome. And it, the, the one picture that you shared with the lilac mm -hmm. one, everyone looked, were smiling, mm -hmm. they were all happy. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could have gotten the picture before a couple of the people wandered off, but uh, they all came out so pretty and they were all so different. Even though we we're all painting the same thing, everyone had their own little, their own personality in theirs, and I thought that was so cool to see. Because I don't teach in person that much, um, so it's nice to see what they, you know, what people are creating, as they're creating it too. I wish I got a picture of the students with their rose painting, but that got done at five, and the show ended at five, and they were like, "You got five minutes, like afterwards, to clean up," and I'm like, "Okay, guys, we've got to be done at five. We have to be done at five. They were not fooling around. Well, yeah, everyone wanted to go home. I think, you know, that the vendors and stuff were tired, but. Probably. I was hoping that they would just let us stay there as long as we wanted, because I know there was a scrapbooking crop going on, but they probably didn't want poor Denise Sander to be responsible for the likes of me. And my, <laughs> <laughs> and my people. 
uh, Paulage One Art. I just got the Karen Dosh palette with smooth and rough side. Rough side for watercolor pencils to make oh, puddle yeah, of I've color. Heard of that. Do you have a DIY mini rough watercolor pencil palette for travel? Uh, I don't, but I don't see why you couldn't just buy an inexpensive palette and sand it. You know, so that you can like rough up the um, rough up that that stuff. Or if you get the woodless pencils or watercolor crayons, you could cut off a little slice of it and put it into a palette. I've never tried that. That does look really cool, though. It's like a, a gritty kind of feeling plastic palette that you can color your like your ink tents blocks or your crayons or watercolor pencils and make yourself a little palette. Kind of like those paint by number coloring books I used to have when we were kids. I don't know if you remember those. I don't. There were two different kinds. There were ones that would have the little palette at the bottom of the paper and then there was one where like there would be these dots uh, and you'd paint over it with a wa wet brush and then it would come to oh, life. Oh yeah 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 I do Love remember. Okay those. yes I do remember that. Now that you say that, I do remember it. If you want to doodle on any other leaves, feel free. Just kind of, uh, just make a little like nodule coming off of a branch. Or if you happen to have like a splat that looks like a nodule, go ahead and you know, doodle on some little leaves. That way you can make it balance, make it fill, um, kind of according to how you've painted it and how your background splatters went. You can adapt it. Now, if you want to park anything up, uh, you can with like a white color pencil or a white gel pen. You can intensify any of your colors because sometimes you might lose the brightness of a color. You can go in with um, white watercolor crayon, white color pencil, uh, whatever you want, and you can pop some colors up. I really don't think it's necessary. I think that that, you know, I think it, I think I retain the lights well enough on there, but it's always an option. Uh, I do want to add some more splashes because I happen to like that look, but if you don't, then don't do it. That's completely up to you. Um, I'm going to be using some of my brighter colors, like my ultramarine blue, and I'm using a big wet brush. And what I just do basically is hold my hand over areas I don't want to spatter. And sometimes I'll just go in and splash clean water. And you don't have to be as careful when you're doing clean water splashing because um, if you get it where you don't want it, if you blot it quickly, uh, it's not going to lift anything underneath. And I find that especially true when we're doing this technique where we wet the entire paper. I'm wondering if maybe wetting the paper helps lock those colors in the surface and helps it resist lifting as you're doing your glazing. So that might be another benefit if you are using, you know, your less expensive papers. And now I'm just going to dab in some of the purples and reds so it can kind of I can put it where I want and then it can kind of float off into some of the other spatters that are there if you don't like anything you're doing just blot it off before it sets I like to do a combination of dabbing and splattering but I know it's not everyone's cup of tea Do some green. I like it because it reminds me of kind of like rain or, you know, little buds kind of blossoming. And, and you see in the springtime, you just see little bits of foliage. Oh, speaking of which, I got pictures of my lilacs, Ooh. which is good because they're all done flowering. Oh, good. So I can send you a few if you want to do a you. lilac picture in the future. And Thank my peonies are getting ready. They're getting super fat <gasps> blossoms oh, on them. I so. love peonies. A lilac tutorial in the new class, actually. The oh. same one, the same one I did in Airbnb. Okay. I filmed it for, um, I filmed it for the course as well because a lot of people were bummed that they couldn't make it to the live class, and um, I didn't have any plans to teach any other classes out in the world. That's a lot of work. That is. Man, a hats off to to <laughs> teachers that go and do that, oh. man. We go down to the library once a month. That's my pace. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, you're a little busy too. You have like other life stuff, you know, and you also want to be able to enjoy the summer. Absolutely. It's too short, so you gotta gotta enjoy it. So don't forget to grab those splashes. If you got like green on your flower and you don't want that, just blot it off. So you can soften any of the splashes just by blotting them. 
and you can also dab on more color where you want it. I think I want to do a little bit of the burnt sienna. I kind of like to splash the colors a little bit more full, well, not full strength, but unmixed a little bit um, because I just think that when they puddle together on the paper, it just gives it a nice kind of fun look. But I don't necessarily clean my brush between grabbing another color just so that they will be a little bit integrated. Okay, well, I think at this point I will dry this so you can see how it turns out. If anybody in the chat thinks I should add some colored pencil or watercolor crayon over this to brighten stuff up, um, let me know because I'm here to teach you. <laughs> you know, I'm not concerned with how the painting comes out. Um, I have my other one if I'm really concerned about it. So uh, if anybody has any suggestions or wants to see me try a technique on there, then go ahead and let me know. And I'll dry this so you can see how it turns out all dry. waiting for some people to, uh, to chime in. I'm sure we'll have some people that will want to see some other techniques. Well, I put all my stuff, all my, like, pencils and crayons and stuff on my table so that they're right there. Yes, so, that, so I can grab them because I really enjoyed having my supplies like that upstairs. Yes. Well, it's nice to just grab them. Mm -hmm. You don't have to truck through. And... I think I might paint, repaint some of those leaves where they got a little mushy with the spatters. Gail AC thinks it looks great as is. Okay. It's our first vote. We have another vote, lovely as is. All right. They are surprising me today. Yeah. Well, it is really nice. Oh, thank you. Any other questions from the from the group? We're caught up. Nice. People are chatting about apparently there's places you can do cat yoga where there's cats. Oh my gosh. Well, you do yoga and then Kathy, what are you saying? There's a place near her where they do goat yoga, like they have the pygmy goats. Oh, wow. It's like, oh. Uh, another, we have two votes, beautiful as is. Okay. Uh, well, there. Janine Chrysler. Well, the Senlier assorted tips for acrylic pouches that came in the Smart Art Box fit on the Arteza acrylic pouches. I was wondering that same thing, but I don't have any of the Arteza okay. pouches. Oh, yeah. I was wondering the same thing because that would be kind of cool because the Arteza paint's way cheaper. <laughs> uh, we're getting many votes for looks good as it is. Okay. Well, we'll just leave it at that. Um, <coughs> and that pretty much does it. Well, you know what? I actually did do a little gel pen on the eye. And a little, did I do a sliver on the beak? I did do a little sliver on the beak. And I did do a little bit of white pencil on the tips of the flower and a little bit of magenta on the shadow. So I can put them side by side. You can kind of see both of them together. Can I put them both? I can kind of put them both on like this. So this is one we just did. That's the one I did earlier. I think we can. you can see them both like that. Um, I uh, have links to everything that I used pretty much in the video description. I didn't link up to the brushes because I have a Hod Podge here, but um, they should be pretty easy to find online or in any of your um, even big box craft stores. And I really encourage if you're not absolutely sure about a brand to go into a store and, you know, pick them up, look at them. You can tell if there's like bent bristles or if some bristles look like they're falling out or you can actually like I'll pick up a brush and I'll actually just kind of feel it and there it will be stiff because it'll have sizing in it but if there's any bris bristles that are going to come out they'll come out in your finger and you can see if the tip is bent or if anything just doesn't look right with the brush so that's that would be my recommendation especially if you just need one or two brushes they charge you an arm and a leg on Amazon for shipping if you're just getting one or two brushes so um, I would definitely recommend picking them up in shop if you can um, the coupon code for my class is good through the end of the month. And, um, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have questions, you can leave them in the comments and I will answer them. Um, and if you go to this, the page of my class, you just follow the link in the video description. You can see every lesson, like you can see the list of all the lessons. So you can kind of get an idea of what they're all about. And if it's something that would be useful to you, do you have anything to add? I'm all set. I don't have anything. 
anything to add. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up before you take off today. That really helps my channel. And um, until next time, happy crafting.